All right. Thank you for getting that started, Stephen. Um, I'll do a quick shout out that we are a essentially a community here that uh, is a community driven uh, meetup group where we have people within the community present. So we're always looking for more volunteers to uh, walk us through Kaggle competitions. I don't do this every time. Um, but uh, when I do do it, I learn a lot and it is really motivating for me and it's really inspiring me to hopefully do more of these moving forward because I really feel like I gain so much out of doing these, uh, out of doing these presentations. So quick shout out or a quick call for volunteers there. Uh, so the meetup or the the Calgary competition I'm going to cover today is going to be focusing on NLP and it's going to be focused on trying to understand what transformer models are um, and how, and we'll maybe have some fun uh, with using some simple implementations of them. Okay, so our agenda today, uh, there is there are two competitions that I wanna cover, both uh, binary classic classification NLP competitions. Um, the reasons I chose these was that a few months ago, we watched this Kaggle Grandmaster series on um, how they are winning NLP competitions, or not winning, but like placing very well in NLP competitions. And essentially everybody these days is using this new method um, called transformer models. And at work, I'm a little bit behind the times. I've been using some other deep learning models and I really wanted to, um, to learn about these new models and to learn how to apply them. Um, and this is a kind of a really uh, good way to motivate, motivate myself to do that. Uh, and uh, I think Kaggle is a really good place to make sure that you understand how these models work because you essentially submit your results uh, to a leaderboard and you see how well you do relative to everybody else. And so if you've implemented something wrong, you know, in some cases you might still get seemingly good results, but uh, Kaggle will make it obvious that you have done something wrong. And so, uh, yeah, it's a, a really good tool for, for learning in that way. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too long on the competitions because the, they, they were covered before. One of them was covered in the Grandmaster series and another one was actually one I competed in and presented on uh, a year and a bit ago um, on predicting sincere or un insincere questions. Um, but the, the, the task in both of them is very similar. Uh, and it's one that I think everybody can understand. So we'll do a little bit of data exploration just to kind of show you guys what the data looks like, but we'll focus on some of the theory behind NLP and some of the theory behind the transformer models. And then we'll, we'll look at uh, other use cases of transformers. And then at the very end, we'll, uh, we'll cover uh, a simple implementation of a transformer model on one of the competitions. So there will be some live coding. So everybody can look forward to that. Um, so yeah, I think I covered everything here. Brief history of NLP, which is the theory, uh, math behind self-attention, uh, some some of the different variations in, inside the transformer network. So this is like, what's the difference? What is the difference between BERT? What's the difference uh, between BERT and GPT-3 and BART or T5? They're all actually kind of different architectures. So we'll learn about that. And then the competition solution. All right. Oh yeah, I'm on this computer. Okay, so the first competition. Uh, this is the one that we're going to look at the data and do a bit of data exploration. It's whether a question is sincere or not. It was hosted by Cora and the competition ended two years ago. Uh, the second competition, which is the one that was covered in the um, Grandmaster series, uh, was also a binary classification. This one is trying to classify if a comment from, that was pulled from Wikipedia or the civil comments data set determining if a comment was toxic or not. So zero one predictions for both of these. Uh, the interesting thing about the second competition, which we won't spend too much time on because the, the, the strategy for solving is essentially the same as, this, as the strategy for solving the first one, it, but it sounds, it sounds interesting and novel. And that is that the training data was all in English. 
I think, or maybe there was a couple of other languages, but the test, the test data included languages that was not in the training data at all. So how do we build NLP models that are uh, like language uh, agnostic kind of like how are, how is a, a model going to work on multiple languages, even if it hasn't seen any in its training set. So that's a, that's a problem that almost seems impossible, but uh, we'll see that, that some of these pre-trained models actually can already do that out of the box for you. And so given that they can do it out of the box, the way that you train a model to be able to do that is essentially fine tuning it. And, and that's essentially what we're doing to solve both of these. Okay, so first bit of live coding. I want to take a look at this first competition, the Cora question, the Cora insincere question classification. And I have a uh, notebook that's up on Kaggle that anybody can that anybody can use. So I've shared my slides here, and there's a link uh, down at the bottom of this slide. Anybody can go to this afterwards, and you can just clone it and run this. So, uh, you know, people will be able to will be able to build these uh, NLP models that we're going to cover later today, and they can also look at the data if they want. So, as a reminder, we're predicting if a question asked in query is sincere or not. It's binary classification. So we're just going to load in the data. So Kaggle the Kaggle kernel kernels provide a very easy way for adding data to your uh, notebooks. You just kind of click this add data thing up here. Uh, I've, I, I haven't played around with Kaggle kernels too much. I think the last time I did was the last time I presented, which was a couple of years ago. But they're just really nice to work with. And you have, you have access to a GPU. I could also have selected a, a TPU. I was a little scared to select that. Uh, you get 40 hours. Oh, what did I just do? Oh, I think I might have to start this over again. You get 40 hours or 30 hours a week on the GPU. So, you know, even if you don't have a good computer, you still have the ability to to learn a lot of these cutting edge things just by taking advantage of what Kaggle offers you. I don't know if the kernel reset or not, but I'm just gonna pretend it did. So I uh, I went through because some of these some of these questions are just uh, awful. Uh, so I decided not to do a random sampling of questions. I've, I've handpicked some positive cases. So these that we're looking at the training data here, and I've pulled up cases where our target, which means our insincere question or not, uh, is one. So these are going to be insincere questions that uh, are in the training set. So has the United States become the largest dictatorship in the world is insincere. Did Julius Caesar bring a Tyrannosaurus Rex on his campaign to frighten the Celts into submission? Uh, why don't poorer countries print more money to use for paying for education, et cetera? Um, that's kind of a topical one. There's a lot of money printing going on. And then you'll notice that some of these are a little bit noisy. Like, uh, you know, maybe this is, I don't know, are these? Maybe some of these are actually sincere and they're, they're not insincere, but uh, I think you can find that better in the negative examples. So here we have, these are all, these are all sincere. Um, yeah, so what, how, why does velocity affect time? Is it crazy if I wash or wipe my groceries off? Germs are everywhere, also very topical. Uh, remember this was from a couple of years ago. How were the Calgary frame flames founded? Have you licked the skin of a corpse? Okay, I feel like that one might be insincere. So maybe there's some, uh, and I think when, when I was going through the competition a couple of years ago, we did find that there was a lot of noise in the labels to this. So um, that's always something to be aware of when you start competitions, because you might have to, to, to come up with different strategies for exactly how you'll handle noisy labeled data as opposed to really clean labeled data. And then a bit of data exploration. Let's take a look at how many uh, insincere questions there are in sincere ones. So we see that there's a lot more sincere questions than there are insincere questions by a factor of more than 10 to one. 
And so what I've done, it because I've actually gone through this notebook a few times, at the end of this notebook, we will train a model and we will look at predictions and we'll be able to put in any sentence that we want and try to come up with insincere questions. And I found it really hard to come up with insincere questions when I was training data that was this imbalanced. So purely for the sake of this presentation and having a bit of fun at the end to, to try out some, uh, to try out our model on, on text that we choose, I've split the data so that it's going to be evenly split between insincere and sincere. Uh, this is not necessarily a good strategy to use in an actual competition. So just keep that in mind. But it will, it will allow the model to get insincere questions a little bit easier. Okay, and then we're going to come back to this when we train a model. So I'm going to go back to those slides. And if anybody has a question at any time, feel free to interrupt me or uh, just uh, find a pause in what I'm saying and, and ask me at any time. So present. Okay, so if you had, if you were at our meetup uh, a couple months ago when we watched the Calgary Grandmaster series, um, you will already be aware of this, but this is kind of just further evidence. Uh, essentially, the winners of this recent competition, um, and this is a third place solution that I didn't look too hard. This is just one that was posted on the forums at the top. They basically all used transformer models to win the competition. And so here we see that the third place used three different types of the Roberta model. This is a BERT variant, also a BERT variant, model BERT, and then they did a little bit, bit of post processing. So they just ensembled all of these ones together. Uh, and you can do so quite easily, actually. Um, well, maybe easy is a strong word, but you can do that simpler than you would expect using the transformer library. So everybody should be learning how to use transformers. Uh, hey, Matt, just to interrupt for a second. Uh, R had a question in the chat about the workbook, uh, the notebook that you were working through. Is there a link to that in somewhere? Yep. The link is down here. Uh, so okay. if you look at the slides. Yeah. And the, the link to your slides is in the meetup. Uh, the link to the slides is in the meetup. That's right. I can also put it in the... Maybe someone uh, can find it, put it in the chat here as well. Yeah. That would be great if yeah. somebody could do that. Oh, and uh, Cray just put it in the chat. So nice. If you go to if you go to that link, uh, you'll get the link to the notebook. Thanks. Yeah. So all you had to do is I think you just had to clone it, and then it, and then it creates your own version of the notebook, and then you know you can edit that uh, to your uh, heart's delight. Okay. So before we dive straight into the transformers, and this is a mistake that I think is quite tempting and one that a lot of the people are making these days, because it is so easy to use the Transformers library, it's, it's kind of appealing to just you know, dismiss all of the previous NLP and just use Transformers and treat it as a black box and not really understand what's going on or understand the history of NLP. I kind of feel like that's a mistake. I'm also a bit biased because I did spend all that time learning uh, the history of NLP. And so, you know, I've been in the field for like a few years now. And so I had to. Um, so I don't know if it's the right approach or not. Maybe other people can comment, but I feel like it is useful to know the history of where we are and how we got here uh, and, you know, what weaknesses our current approach has. So I'm going to be focused on two aspects of. The history of NLP that I often don't see broken down in this way. Uh, I usually don't see people talking about the difference of tokenization over time. Uh, so that kind of inspired me to talk about it. Um, and then document res representation. This is about how to turn tokens uh, into models, and that's that's essentially where I'm most of the interest is. Most of the interest is that's like the modeling part of things. So let's start on the tokenization. Uh, so first thing that we have to do to do machine learning on text is to figure out how to re represent that in a way that a computer can understand. Uh, and so, you know, a, a sentence consists of when we read a sentence, we see a whole bunch of discrete units. Uh, the first most intuitive thing is to break those units uh, up into something that in NLP we call tokens. And the most straightforward way is just to do that at a word level. So 
every unique word we see or every you know punctuation we're going to split apart and we'll treat every word on its own uh, independently from every other word so i've i've tried to list out kind of some of the problems here uh, there are more issues than just this but this is kind of like the main one that will kind of cut us through so slight deviations in spelling when when a human reads a word, if it has like an S at the end or an or an E D or an L Y or something, uh, you know, we, we know that that word is very closely related to the uh, word that doesn't have that S or the E D, and so an improvement that one can make on splitting everything by words is to do a little post processing, and and so some of these techniques would be lemming, or lemmatization, stemming, uh, so you know representing a word that has an S at the end uh, as the same token as the word that doesn't have the S. Um, or you could do some uh, tricky normalization. So let's say you've got a whole bunch of numbers in your data, but numbers themselves have you know pretty much the same sort of meaning in the sentence as every other number. So you might want to replace all numbers with the same sort of token, for example. Uh, so one of the downsides of doing post-processing like this is that it is actually quite a large manual effort to do a good job um, and you're never going to do a perfect job and so you always have to solve the edge cases where you haven't been able to group things together that have the same meaning so you you want your kind of model after that to be able to do that job for you anyways and so why not let's just focus on doing a better job of having the model take care of that rather than doing the post-processing or doing the pre-processing sorry um, another way of getting around these slight deviations of spelling is you can um, represent each word, you know, in the same way. Each word gets its own token, but along with that token comes some additional information. Uh, so, like all of the characters can themselves be can themselves get their own tokens, and then you can represent a word with a group of characters and a and a token itself. So that that does give some performance. Uh, boosts when we'll see in the next slide, certain models use that, but still we have this problem with all these approaches in that words that don't occur very often in your training set are very hard to handle in your testing set. Uh, if a word only occurs once or twice, uh, it's hard to say what impact that has on the, on the final class. And so normally you'll say there's a minimum threshold that a word has to appear uh, in a document for it to be able to get a token at all. Um, or for it to be able to get a unique token at all. Uh, and so then there's like all these different approaches for how do we handle these, like how, how do we handle a token that we've seen very few times or that we've never seen in, when it comes to inference. And so there's a variety of different strategies that people used over time to handle this. One, the most simplest one is just to kind of assign this new like unknown token that gets its own representation in the model. Or some cases, if you're doing like a sequence, if you're if you're if you're comparing two sentences together, if the same unknown word token like appears in both of them, then you'll give it some sort of like random initialization. And then if it appears in one of them, anyways, there's like there's all this effort that was put into it. So it's a big problem. Um, and so some of the ways of getting around these rarely seen or never seen tokens. One of them is just to use only character information, forget the words entirely because you're not gonna see any new characters. Uh, this unfortunately leads to a loss of performance because it's very hard to model uh, a word just based on the character alone. Uh, if you're doing deep learning, each, every character is gonna get a vector and then you somehow have to represent, you not only need to represent the sentence, but you need to represent each word uh, with a meaningful representation and becomes very difficult to do. Actually, yeah, at work at Boeing, we have a model that only looks at characters, uh, which hopefully will be improved shortly, but um, that one performs well, but that's a kind of special situation. Um, so the, the solution that this is all leading up to is what the kind of modern day models use now, and that's something called subword tokenization. So the theory here is that the words that occur often in our data set, those are great to just leave as the word tokens because we, we, we've seen those a lot of times. So we, we, we can represent those pretty well with numbers. Uh, the rare words or the unknown words in the test set are uh, essentially decomposed into quote unquote meaningful subwords. So you, you look through all of your corpus when you're 
when you're it, it, a tokenization is kind of like a, something that you learn to do at the beginning of the modeling. It's like the first step. You learn which subword sequences of characters occur often, and then you give those a token of their own, um, such that when you break up unknown words, you can represent them with you know somewhat uh, recognizable subwords. Uh, I have additional information because there's actually quite a few different ways of doing this. Uh, there are different strategies for how to, to accomplish these few goals, and I didn't look into it that much. What I did do is I created a, some examples of kind of the outputs of it. So I have a Jupyter Notebook that's running on this computer. Uh, let's look at the tokenizer. Actually, maybe I'll stop. Did anybody have any questions about any of this? I've just been flying. I, I have a language question. So what language do you guys use when you do tokenization? Is it Python or is it like R or is it? Yeah, uh, pretty much everything I do is in Python. So okay. the answer to what language was Python. Okay. But I know that inside of the transformers library, they have this thing called, actually, I can show it to you. They have this thing called Roberta Tokenizer Fast and BERT Tokenizer Fast. This fast bit refers to that they actually do the computation in Rust because it's actually like more efficient than Python. But we don't need to worry about that. Okay. Really, um, can you describe how you turn a word into a token? Um, Maybe we'll go through this and then you'll let me know if this answers your question because I'm not sure I completely understand. So we're going to load in the here's our trans here's our magical transformers library that does everything for us these days. Uh, from that, we're going to import these two tokenizers that have been pre trained uh, while the Roberta model was training or actually right before the Roberta model was training on the same on the same corpus that the Roberta model was trained on. And same with the BERT tokenizer. And all you need to do is you can take from pre-trained, I'm going to do BERT a large because I did down, I downloaded both of these ahead of time. Roberta a large will give us, I guess, slightly better tokens because the only difference between large and base is that it just had a bigger data set. Okay, so let's tokenize this sentence. Let's see how an unnecessarily complicatedly sentence is tokenized. I was trying to make up a word here. Hannah has told me that that actually is a word, but it doesn't make grammatical sense, but that's okay. You, 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 find, the, you find this in LV all the time. The sentence doesn't have to make sense. So what is a reverted tokenizer? How is it going to represent this into tokens? So our first token is let, and then we have an apostrophe s, because I think that occurs often. So that gets its own representation. And then we see this weird, funny symbol g. And what this means is that it means that uh, space preceded this word c. This is necessary because we have cases like complicatedly that's actually split into two tokens. So complicated has occurred enough times that it gets its own token. We can see that it is the start of a word, so it has a this weird G symbol in front of it. But LY does not, and that is allows you to reconstruct this sentence from these tokens. Um, and LY, I guess, occurs often enough that it can be represented on its own. And then we've got sentence is tokenized with split into two. So token is a meaningful subword set of token, and then ized is uh, meaningful as well. So actually, this works out pretty well. It kind of makes intuitive sense. This is a nice way of tokenizing. It would be hard to do this with a kind of like a handwritten rule set. Uh, BERT, as we can see, works a little bit differently. So it gets let, and then it has this apostrophe on its own, and then S on its own. So I feel like already Roberta is a little bit better because uh, I don't feel like S as a word makes much sense. Or as a token makes sense, let's see how, and, and then it splits up unnecessarily into a few different tokens. So on occurs often. Uh, it splits up complicatedly in the same way that makes sense as reverted. And then this one splits the exclamations up into three different tokens. Roberta says, I've seen three exclamation tokens. 
sparks in a row often enough that has its own meaning um, and we get token here make sense what was that what, what was that question yeah it was how do you split you know words into tokens but it looks like you've just shown that so <laughs> Can I answer right. question? All right, so these will be kind of the starting step for when they're put into the model. So you can kind of imagine this is like the, the, I guess in some ways, like the, the input space, the feature space. Uh, Matt, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, are we using the words or the subwords? We yes. are using this let will will be treated and we'll get an embedding separately than this one, which will mm -hmm. be getting a different embedding than this one. One interesting thing to note is that the start of the sentence, you'll notice that it doesn't have a preceding space. You can actually add a little thing in the tokenizer to say, okay, if it's at the start of the sentence, we're going to give it this G because let without the G and let with the G are embedded separately. So they have different embeddings. Mm -hmm. So that means we are not going to use uh, the subwords which are there in cell number six? um yep these subwords will be used yep so this okay so i i see what you're, you're saying now so um this uh hashtag hashtag ne will have a word embedding so it will say anytime i see any that's in the middle of a word i'm always going to represent that with the same vector mm -hmm. okay and it will be different than any on its own without these hashtags but you can you can just imagine these hashtags as, as something to make the token like unique from uh, if the hashtags hadn't appeared. Okay, okay, right. Thanks. So, so if these tokenizers are learned, yes, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's the first step. You, you, yeah, and you, but you talked about them as being an input to the models. So, but they're learned as a pre-processing training before the models. Okay. So by the time you're putting things into the models, it's a fixed, trained, or or do they get updated as the model gets updated? Nope. I think it, they're they're fixed. Yeah. Okay. Good. So Matt, uh, I have also a question. How about the tone of a sentence, like being sarcastic or something like that? I mean, does this library capture those kind of stuff that are, that are not? Uh, I mean. Uh, expressing in a word, but still there. If you read a sentence, you can grasp that. So, yeah, you've pointed out one of the most difficult problems in NLP, and that's how to capture sarcasm because it's uh, it's actually quite. It requires quite a bit of intelligence to understand when somebody's being sarcastic and when they're not sarcastic. And we can maybe play around with that a little bit. We can we can try some like really sarcastic uh, questions, and we can see if the uh, if the classifier picks them up as insincere or not, I, I think that it's going to struggle with those. Um, but just in terms of this, what we're seeing here, uh, there's nothing we can do about that in terms of like how we tokenize stuff. That's something that's going to have to that the model is going to have to pick up. And just a question regarding like the next section for embeddings. So if you are not um, like there, if you have the contraction here dash s. Uh, so if you were to use another uh, um, embedding model like Word to Vec or Fast Text, you'd have to convert it in a manner that it would recognize that word in that, that space, right? Mm -hmm. So then we can't use the robot roboter tokenizer for if you want to use something outside of the roboter for uh, embeddings. Well, you could use it. If you want to if you want to train a model from scratch, um, but yeah, when when we're when we're going to be using our uh, when we're we're going to be building our models later on in the session, the tokenizer is tied to the model itself. Yeah, so these you wouldn't be able to use a Bert tokenizer with a Roberta uh, model, for instance, because the Roberta model was trained with these tokens in mind, and the Bert model was trained with these tokens in mind. Uh, so I, th I think what you, I think that's what you're getting at, and I think that intuition is right. Yes, yeah, yeah. So when they when they say they're using different models, that means they're running their own independent tokenizers for each 
each model, uh, and then the output is is uh, combined. Um, I'm not sure I understood that. So if, if they were going to use Roberta and Bert, they would feed their respective tokenizers uh, to generate their own unique embeddings, and then they feed that into the framework to do whatever classification or sentiment analysis, and then they combine the final output layer to get the, okay. That's right, yep. Okay. Awesome, thanks. Okay. Uh, this is going to be the most difficult slide to cover because uh, there's just so much information in here and it was very hard to try to condense down into certain points and I, I'm going to rely on jumping back and forth between other slides to try to explain certain concepts here, but there's a, there's a few sort of ideas that I want to flow throughout this. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to do like a brief history of uh, NLP modeling and some of the weaknesses involved in the previous models and some of the ways that the, as we kind of go down, we'll get into better and better performing models. So I'll, I'll try to explain what problems these models were solving as we go down. Uh, but feel free to ask questions and stop me as we go and even help me out because this is, uh, yeah, there's a lot of information here and I, I'm sure I'll get some of it wrong. Okay, so simple models. This, these are ones that everybody would learn in school. Uh, intuitively, these are well, the ones that make the most sense to me. Uh, so we've got, uh, we're gonna do our one hot encoding, which is essentially, we're gonna, we're gonna treat every word kind of completely independently, and we're gonna put it into a sparse matrix because the way that we're gonna represent a document is just like a bag of words where every word uh, will get a certain column in this large matrix. And then if it occur, if it occurs in that document, then it'll then there will be a one there, or in TIF yeah, there might be a slightly different number, but most of the values will be zero. And so we'll have a sparse matrix uh, where we'll have few values um, that will represent uh, a document. And so you know you can build simple traditional models off of this. You can build decision trees, logistic regression, XGBoost, uh, you know stuff like that. Uh, this was, I think, around up until 2013. This is this is essentially where NLP was, and everybody was building on top of this, trying to build more and more complexity on top of that initial representation of a word. And then Word of Ec came along, and the idea of representing a word uh, with a vector um, in a way that could be trained. Uh, in an unsupervised or semi-supervised way. So we, we can take all of the text data out there in the world. We can look at what words occur nearby each other. And simply based off of that, we can start saying, okay, well, words that occur nearby each other should be somewhat in a similar space or represented similarly. Um, or maybe I got that wrong. Words that occur in similar context should get similar vectors. Um, and so there's this famous example. Oh, I should have a full screen. There's this famous example of like, you know, king minus man equals queen, or you take the vector for king, you take the vector for man, uh, the vector for queen, and then king minus man plus woman equals, uh, hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about. King minus man plus woman equals queen. You can do this weird like, vector math and like all of a sudden you're like oh my gosh there's so much meaning in these vectors so like this changed kind of the the way everybody was viewing nlp and now all of a sudden it's swapped from using rather than using these sparse matrices uh we're now gonna be using we're now gonna be starting from these like word vectors and we're gonna be building deep learning models off of that and so you know, all of a sudden we're getting state-of-the-art results and everybody's talking about, oh, okay, transfer learning is here for NLP and stuff like that. But uh, it's, uh, so yeah, so this started in 2013. Um, the problems with this approach and the weaknesses that we had here uh, was that every word essentially is represented always with the same vector. Um, actually, before I, before I go into that, this is, this is a simple LSTM in case people hadn't seen it before. 
we're going to represent every every word in a in using kind of like this word vector that's trained on this giant corpus and then we have our a small label data and we're going to say okay the word uh, this unfortunate i couldn't find an english version of this so this is a, a word it has a certain embedding it's going to be fed into this lstm layer um, and we've got all of these different words with all these different vectors. And so the problem is, well, how do we combine all these vectors into a way that we're going to be able to represent the sentence with a vector? Because that's essentially what you need to do for a classification task. You need one vector to represent the sentence. So you feed it into this LSTM or RNN, or it can even be a CNN. And you, then you do this computation on this vector. Then you pass it over to the next CNN. You take in another word. You do another mathematical equation, combine these two, blah, blah, blah. And you go all the, all the way to here. Then it feeds in the air, and then you've got our class, and then we can do our training, and we can back propagate. Uh, there's quite a few inefficiencies with this uh, that some of them were solved just within the LSTM framework. Um, some of them were not, but essentially, the thing that was really holding back these approaches was that the word. Uh, let me find a different example. The word "new" in this case is always has the same representation. Um, or imagine the word stick. The word stick can actually have many, many different meanings depending on the context that it's in. But in this framework, we're representing stick with just a specific set of vectors or with a, with a specific vector. And the model is gonna be responsible for having to learn all of the different ways, all of the different meanings behind stick. And it was in solving this problem that we had another leap in kind of state-of-the-art models. Uh, and I, you guys might be familiar with the model ELMO. I learned about tag LM as I was researching this. Tag LM actually came a little bit before ELMO. But the big improvements that we made on these word to vec RNN, LSTM, CNN models was that we started to add in kind of a contextualized word representation for words along with the uh, word vector, uh, kind of the, the same vector for every word. So I was rambling a little bit there. Hopefully you guys are still somewhat following me, um, but does somebody have a question? Okay, so I'm gonna walk through this example and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll make it clear how we've got, how, how we're actually doing this context, contextual word representation and how we're adding it to these networks. So we're still using RNN and RNNs and LSTMs here. Uh, okay, so this is a, the objective of this task in tag LM was to predict the tag of every word in a sentence. So New and York are both locations. So the the goal will be to predict the location tags for these two words. So we'll start out, and this is this is kind of our traditional LSTM RNN network. We're going to start with the word uh, token embedding for new. Uh, remember a slide ago, I said you can also add some character information. So in this model, they did that. So we've got our new token embedding, and then we've got some a CNN or RNN that's going to go over the characters to try to give another representation representation for new. We're going to concatenate those together. Still, this is just kind of traditional LSTM network. Then we're going to go through the first layer of the LSTM. And now here is where the novel idea comes in. We're going to use this pre-trained bidirectional language model, uh, which is a model that's trained on a huge corpus that is uh, different than just word of act because it's going to, uh, the, the word new is going to be represented by this network that is trained to try to predict the next word given all the other words. So the output of this pre-trained bi bidirectional language model uh, that is not, it's not tunable during this training is just kind of added as an additional feature. This is a contextualized re word representation for the word new because it is looking at all these other words as it comes up with the representation. This is passed to this tag LM model in the middle of this, uh, in the middle of its uh, by LSTM. And then that's passed on to the next one. And this gave like a big performance increase. And so, yeah, how was that? Did anybody have any questions? I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking, but feel free to interrupt me. So the backward language model that that's basically looking at the end of the sentence and then trying to find the meaning of what new means 
at the beginning of the sentence? Okay, so yeah, so there's this for language model that's trained to, to take in new and then to try to predict the next word, uh, what's going to follow new. So new is going to get York and then it's going to, this is going to be trying to predict the next word. It's going to be trying to predict is here. Um, and so it's going to get a whole bunch of different examples for how to, to do that based on, so the, the next example with New York is, and then the next word we'll try to predict, it will be located. So this is a kind of a model that's, this is a forward language model that's trained to try to do that task. This is a backward language model that's essentially going in the reverse direction. It's saying, okay, we've got located is York, and then we want to try to predict New here. So that's what is in this uh, RNN state. That's essentially what this model has learned to do. So when the when it gets to the output in this one, it will be trying to give a representation for like the word. Actually, I don't know if it's the word York or if it's the word is, but it's it's some sort of contextualized word representation. So if if this was like um, old York, when it by the time it gets here, the York is fed through and old is fed through, and they're combined. And this is like a this is a different word embedding for York than if it was New York, right? Because there's uh, this influence of this arrow. So this is like a representation for the word York that takes into account the other words that are in the sentence. As opposed to this one where the word new is always having the same representation every single time you see the word new. Okay, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, we can talk a little bit about Elmo as well. Elmo added actually not that much novel that's over tag LM. In fact, uh, Christopher Manning just reused this slide and just replaced this, <laughs> this part with Elmo. Uh, Elmo is a slightly different model here. It doesn't look, look at words anymore. It looks at characters, but it's essentially trying to solve the same task. It's a language model. It's trying to predict the next word given the previous words. Um, and what Elmo did is Elmo is a little bit deeper. So instead of just one by LSTM layer, there's like two of them. And uh, Elmo doesn't only look at the final state for each word. It also looks at some of the intermediate states and then does some sort of like uh, weighted average of the all, of all of those states. So it, it uses information from uh, the middle of the network as well as the final output of the network for each word. But it's essentially the same sort of concept. We want to use these language models that are trained uh, in a context-aware way uh, and add that information to the model that we're doing. So. The reason that Elmo actually made the news a lot more than TagLM is that Elmo came out and said like, okay, we can actually solve a huge variety of these, of these NLP tasks and then we can get state of the art on a kind of a diverse range of tasks. Whereas I think TagLM just did this one sequence tagging. So that might be, that was a good strategy by Elmo. Okay, so that's TagLM and Elmo. They added this contextual word representation to the network. ULM fit also came around that time and also achieved state of the art performance on a lot of different tasks. So what is ULM fit? It was essentially solving the same sort of thing that, or it was adding a similar sort of information that Elmo was adding in a different way. So the way that ULM fit works is that you train a language model on a huge corpus uh, and you have a lot, a, a much deeper model than you have in uh, Elmo. Elmo only had two layers, but this one has like four layers. Um, it's just doing next word prediction, right? So it's just a traditional language model. Um, this is kind of the backbone of the network. Then you do further language model fine tuning on the corpus that you're interested in doing your NLP task on. So this is still just another language model. And now at the very end, what we're going to do is we're going to, when we're, when we're going to start to train our task, we're just going to freeze this language model part of the model, and we're going to replace it with a different task, which in this case looks like it's just like a classification task. So we're going to say, which of these two classes does this represent? And so essentially the same sort of information uh, is happening here to give an advantage. We're, we're learning some sort of contextualized word representation by the time it gets to this classification step.
Okay, so both uh, Tag LM, Elmo, and ULM Fit, or all three of those, were still just using the RNN LSTM infrastructure. Um, and the one new thing that Transformer Models uh, adds on top of this, you can actually see this came earlier, but it wasn't until BERT came around in like mid 2018 that this became really famous. Um, I, I don't know if that's true. It might be famous before, but I was a little bit confused by the order of these. Um, and that's that they, they also have a way of doing context, contextual word representation. They achieve that uh, via self-attention, but they're able to do this in a way that can be parallelized. So if you remember how RNNs work, in order to get to this final output, you first have to do this word through the LSTM, have to calculate this state, and then you can feed this one in, have to calculate this state, and then you can feed this. So it's kind of like a sequential way, which GPUs are not really good at doing, and it eventually just essentially makes this a lot slower to train and more kind of time intensive. And so transformer models are able to capture con contextual word information in a way that every input word can be calculated at the same time. And so I think that that is one of the main reasons that transformers like really, or one of the huge advantages that they have over these other ones, because they're essentially taking the same advantage of trying to get contextual word of representation rather than just the same vector for every word. But uh, they're able to do it in a way that can be parallelized. So if you're interested in learning more about how that works, uh, you are very lucky because we're gonna go through a little bit of the math. And this is kind of a bit of a selfish part of the sailing because I really wanted to learn how to do this. And so hopefully we can get through this in an okay state. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause here because I just covered a lot of information. I wanna take any questions if anybody has any. Did people kind of get the ideas that I was trying to get at as we flowed through this? Okay, there were, I did skip out a lot of things. Like this is a, this was in 2013, this is in 2018. There were a lot of different techniques to try to solve this sort of thing. And then there were other weaknesses to the RNN and LSTM model, like vanishing gradients and stuff like that, that had their own solutions and saw advantages, but like, these were the real kind of big milestones because these tasks came along or all three of these came along and just kind of set state of the art for everything. So this is kind of, this was like, a, this was, these were kind of game changers, whereas I skipped over some of the other things here. And attention actually, attention was created before these ones, but uh, uh, not in, not as a contextual word representation way. Okay. How are we doing on time? 7.30. Okay, I'm gonna to try to get through this in 10 minutes. Uh, so math behind encoder's self-attention. So here's our transformer network. This is a, an encoder decoder. This is how it was in the original paper. Uh, we have a input sentence, uh, je suis étudiant. Uh, if you can excuse my terrible accent. Uh, and then it's going to go through all these later layers. This is essentially the task of an encoder is to take a sentence and try to encode it into some sort of numerical representation. So by the time it finishes here, we're supposed to some, we're supposed to say, okay, we've got a good representation for what the sentence means in numbers. And then the decoder stack will essentially start with some sort of uh, initialization, and it will try to um, create a sequence. So this is a this is the kind of a, encoding as a way of taking a sequence and condensing it down. And then we've got something that's condensed down and we want to expand it back out into another sentence. And so this is a translation task. So we're going to translate French to English. Here is a simpler kind of high level view of how that looks like from breaking it down and kind of like the major uh, modeling steps. Uh, for sentence classification, we really only need to know the encoder, right? Because all we need to do is we need to take a, a sequence of words, a sequence of tokens, and we need to encode them in some sort of numerical representation. And then we've got our labels and we just say, okay, well, how do we get from these numbers to these labels? And so I'm just gonna look at encoder 
and these are often split apart. Um, so this isn't something like novel that I'm coming up with. Uh, in fact, different models will only do encoding and cert certain models will only do decoding. And we'll get into uh, those different models in a little bit. So we have a sentence. The sentence is called, the sentence is thinking machines. It's only two words. We're gonna keep it really simple. And I'm gonna quick do a quick shout out for Jay Alomar. He writes really good uh, blog posts on how this all works. So I've just stolen all of his slides and, and we're just gonna kind of walk through the math uh, according to his slides. So we've got thinking machines. Each word is gonna get its own embedding. This is something that we can't avoid. We had to start somewhere, right? We had to start with numbers somehow. So thinking will always get the same initial embedding and machines will always have the same word embedding. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn these, uh, the paper refers to them as query key and value weight matrices that we'll be able to use to, we'll multiply this word embedding with this weight matrix and then we'll get this query representation of the word thinking. Uh, we'll do the same with machines. We'll have a query representation of machines and we'll do the same for keys and for values. So this is just simple matrix multiplication. Uh, the weight matrices are learned, the embeddings are learned in the network. Okay, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna, for the word thinking, and we're just gonna try to think about embedding the word thinking now. So what is a, what is a context represent context aware representation of the word thinking. So we're gonna take the query for thinking and we're gonna multiply it by every other key in the sentence. So the query, I'm uh, not multiplied, dot product. So the, the query is gonna be multiplied by K1 by itself. That's gonna come up with some number 112. It's gonna also be multiplied by the K2 of machines and that's gonna be 96. So this is essentially like how much uh, impact should the word, word machines have on thinking? It's going to be this number. Then there's this scaling factor, which I've never really found any great intuition on besides that it just makes things a little bit easier. Um, so uh, that's a confusion for me. But anyways, we're just going to scale these down and then we're going to apply a softmax so that we get some sort of probability distribution. And so we say that, uh, you know, uh, actually, I think it's the next step. So when we, we're going to try to, Z1 is going to be our context aware representation. And to get to Z1, we're going to take this, the soft max of the Q1 times K1, which is like how much of the word should be paying attention to itself. We're going to multiply by that by the value, the V1 of thinking. And then we're going to do the same for this 0.12, and that's going to be multiplied by V2. And then we're going to add these up, and then we're going to get Z1. So we're going to say that while some of the machines V2 is now in this embedding for the word thinking, which is Z1. And that is kind of the main concept. And then the rest of the next few slides is just, you know, some simple matrix tricks that you can do where you can say, okay, we're gonna just treat this uh, sentence. Each row is gonna be a word and we're just gonna do this in one step rather than a whole bunch of different steps. And so, we multiply, so this value times this gives us this, this value times this gives us this, et cetera. Uh, and then we're gonna condense the, all, all of the kind of previous logic in the one step. Uh, and so we've got our Q ma uh, matrix, which we just calculated here. Uh, multiply our dot product with the K. Oh, is this, a, that's a multiply, I guess. Uh, and then multiply by V, and then we're gonna get the same Z where the, the way that we calculated Z before is just this top row. So the word thinking is now contextually represented in this top row and the word machines is now likewise on the bottom row. And then they also had this idea, well, certain words might, uh, could be seen in like different senses and they might have different reasons for paying attention to different words. And so having only one uh, attention mechanism might not be as good as having you know, multiple attention. So essentially this whole process, uh, this one, this whole process is done eight different times uh, in the network. So we're gonna learn uh, eight different Q matrices, um, weight matrices, eight different K weight matrices, eight different uh, V weight matrices. And then we're going to get 
eight different representations of the word thinking. And uh, the most obvious way, to, the most obvious thing to do next is just to concatenate them all together. Uh, this was not in a slide. I pulled this from another one of his uh, write-ups, and it says, "But the vector isn't ready to be sent to the next sublayer yet. We need to first turn this Frankenstein's monster of hidden states into a homogeneous representation. And so we multiply this huge concatenation with this huge weight matrix, and then we have Z, which will be." Um, captures all the information of all these attention heads. And so this top row is an even, is an even uh, more context aware representation of the word thinking that takes in all of these different attentions at the same time. Uh, and all of this can be done uh, in parallel, right? Nothing so far has, has relied on some previous calculation. So we have our input sentence, we embed each word, split into eight heads, uh, calculate attention with these matrix with these matrices in the way that we just went over, concatenate them all together, multiply by this big wave matrix, and then we're left with Z, which itself will be then be sent uh, will then be treated as X as it kind of goes through the whole process, uh, sometimes like twenty times. Uh, and so all the way up into this point there has been one major piece of information that's been missing, and that is that at no point have we used position. We've just been attending to like all the other words as if they're equals so far. And so the way that they've solved this is something that I still have a very hard wrapping my head, my head around. And I feel like if I don't understand it, maybe there could be a way to improve this, but you know, there is probably some really nice way to explain this but essentially what they do is in the embedding stage so in this stage every vector they add a positional encoding so the first word will be added with this encode with this matrix the second word with this one the third word with this one uh, these are all essentially just different signs and cosine functions and i think there's a different sign and cosine function for each index and then they follow kind of I just screenshotted from a video. These are a few different of those functions. And then the intuition is let the model reason, it lets the model reason about relative positions of any token. So if the orange dimension is slightly higher on one word than another, then it knows if it's to the left or the right of that other word. But I feel like it, it might mess up what this embedding really means. And given that that's what you start with, I feel like you're losing some information. So, but this is, this is how the math works. So. How did I do? 10 minutes exactly. Any questions? I hope there's no questions. <laughs> so in one of the slides, you mentioned that it's done by eight time. Where does the number eight comes from? I Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Okay. Probably somebody just came up with it off the top of their head. Eight's a multiple of two. Okay. Who is a nice number? I don't know. They had eight GPUs. <laughs> they had they had like a thousand. Oh, actually, they usually have like a square of or a exponent of two, right? So maybe there is a reason why it, that would make sense. And to train Roberta, they had a thousand and twenty-four V one hundreds. You can imagine that's a lot of GPUs. Okay. I'm not going to wait any longer. So what we've essentially just described is the process of going from these inputs through one of these layers here, uh, and then you would multiply this a whole bunch more times. But that's essentially how we're getting representations for a sentence or for each word in the sentence. OK, so variations of transformers. There are a few different objectives that transformers can be pre-trained on. Uh, the first ones are called autoregressive uh, models. These are ones that are like your classical language model. This is where you're always trying to predict the next word. And so this only uses the decoder. And the decoder will only uh, works in that it only like looks at the words that it's seen up so far and then tries to predict the next one um, in, a, in a kind of a next word prediction style. 
Uh, and so I think the, the main difference between the encoder and the decoder is just that. I think this, this attention works in a similar way. If you have a full encoder and decoder network, I believe that there are some, there's some attention that the decoder has that also takes in uh, some of the intention mechanisms that are in this encoder step. So that, that's a little bit complicated, but if you're just looking at decoder only and encoder only, I think the only difference is the words that the, the tokens that each word attends to. Um, and so uh, some examples of a decoder only autoregressive model are GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, XLNet. Um, some of these are pretty famous. And then we have an autoencoding transformer. And this is, uh, the objective is to reconstruct the original sentence after it's been corrupted. And so the, the way that they corrupt sentences is one that they can take a full sentence and then they can just mask out one word and then they can say okay model you don't see this word anymore but you see all of its surrounding words uh tell me what this word is and so it's it forces the it forces it to pay attention to kind of like the surrounding words to try to get a good representation of itself um so that's one task another task is actually instead of masking it out it actually will pick a word and replace it with a completely other random word and then it says, okay, now you've got a random word, now predict what the original word was. And so that's like a slightly harder task or, or it forces it to look at the surrounding words even more. Uh, and so some famous examples of this are BERT and XLM models. I think XLM is when it looks at multiple languages. Uh, and this is a uh, self-attention that we had just described where it looks at all of the words around it in the sentence. So this. This you can imagine would give you a better representation for a word than the decoder only one because it's able to use the words that occur after it and the words that occur before it. And uh, you know that you know why not take in a little bit more information to, to get better representations of words. Uh, and then we have sequence to sequence models. This is like the original transformer model. Um, so these some of these tasks would be like translation, question answering. Uh, and these require the encoder and the decoder. And some examples of that are BART and T5. And this is a slide I stole from the uh, Grandmaster Series talk. This just kind of shows you how much data uh, each of these uh, a subset of these models were trained on. So the original BERT, there was an additional learning task in BERT and then it, it did this mask language modeling task, which I just described. It also did a next sentence prediction task where it would take two sentences and say, does, does this sentence follow the, the other sentence that occurred before it? Um, but Roberta dropped that next sentence prediction and it used like a ridiculous amount of data, 160 gigabytes of data. And this is the one that was trained on 1,024 V100 GPUs for one full day. I can't even imagine how much that would cost. Uh, and then distal bird, I'm not that familiar with how this one is trained, but it's essentially solving this, I think the same task. Bird distillation, I'm actually not sure what that is. I think distal bird is just bird with fewer layers. It's like five layers or something, instead of seven, something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, the one thing I read about it is that like they were able to simplify the model a lot and get similar results to bird. So people people prefer distal bird over bird because it's a smaller model. Yeah, base 66, base 110, whatever that means. And XLNet, this is like multiple languages. I guess this is encoder decoder, but I'm actually not sure. Uh, okay, we've got a little bit of time left. Let's have some fun. Let's do some coding. Um, I have a Jupyter Notebook here. Look how, eat, look how little code this is. Uh, and look how much fun we're about to have. Okay, so we're going to, from transformers, we're going to uh, import this class called pipeline. Uh, pipeline can take a whole bunch of different arguments here for different sorts of tasks that you want to do. Let's do a text generation task. So this is going to use one of the decoder models. It's going to do like a next token prediction. We can tell it what model we want to, to, to download. And I've already pre-downloaded these models because they're pretty big. I think this one's like 500 megabytes. Okay, so now we've got our language model in memory. Every time I run this, it gives me something different. So I have no idea what's gonna come up, but uh, let's say after this meetup, I am going to 
And this also always comes up on show what that means. Out of this meetup, I'm going to, this weird symbol, find that I have started to learn that I am still a student of music in the music and studio department at Columbia as I work on teaching my teaching at UCLA. All right. After this meetup, I'm going to eat a few drinks, have a chat for a while. I think I will take the game to my friend. He is not really into this. Okay, that did not do a very impressive job. I wish I could do this with GBT3 because GBT3 is like at the next level. Uh, I'm going to drive to Washington, D.C. To, to see President Trump rally. Oh, no. <laughs> Trump is a great supporter of women, has a great record. Uh, why is the word great occurring so many times around Trump? But I think that he's saying that what he's saying about women today is appalling. Very topical. That's good, GPT. Does anybody have a word they want to put in here? Uh, drink. Drink a glass of Budweiser, but for some reason that is not going to work. The whole thing was just so fun. Yes, the meetup was so fun, just like any other day or night. My partner and I went down, went down to. How about after this meetup, I am never again going to. <laughs> <laughs> Do live coding. After this meetup, I'm never again going to forget the time I took a class and had to explain how to code on it. I also went to a couple of parties with my girlfriend before her last meetup <laughs> with me. I thought a class would. <sighs> Anyways, so like it's so easy to do language modeling tasks here. And once GPT-3 becomes commercially available, like this is how easy it's going to be. Like there, You can just imagine all of the different applications of this sort of thing um like forget the the on your phones like the recommended next word like they'll you'll, you'll have whole ideas you'll be able to have recommended to you and then uh what was the news that came out with microsoft and gpt3 they're gonna help it help you code with it or something yeah i think it's kind of like excel like formulas it's gonna help you compose those from uh, natural language description of the task you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's kind of uh, what GPT-2 and decoder models can do for you. Remember, Bert and those other ones had a different task they were trained on. They were trying to fill the missing words. So we can load in Roberto Large. I had some fun with this one right before the meetup. It's been an exhausting day at sea, but the food was great. It's been an exhausting day at sea, but the view was great. The weather, scenery, company was great. Okay, that's nice. Uh, and then I, what's cool about this is you don't have to have it as a word on its own. You can put it right before a word. So the jellyfish was great. Starfish was great. Uh, no crayfish. But what if we put a space? I was hoping there would be a crayfish. Big fish was great. So different if we do a space there. Fresh fish, tuna, flying. What if we change this to mountain? Does that change anything with fish? Fried fish now. Flying fish. The view was great. Experience was great. I hope you guys are enjoying this as much as me. I love playing around with stuff like this. It's so cool to, uh, to take advantage of these kind of big networks. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to cover in this meetup, and I've got nine minutes to do so, is let's walk through a simple Im implementation of a transformer model uh, doing a classification task. And this is also in the shared notebook so people can walk through this on their own afterwards. Uh, one thing that I unfortunately was not able to finish was, I'll oh, continue editing out. I got all of this whole thing set up like on, oh, this is running on like a Docker container and I had everything set up so that I would be able to run the bird model in here and use my GPU that I have at home and actually be able to do it end to end and 
have a GPU powerful enough to to train a model and everything. But uh, Windows does not support Docker or does not support does not have GPU support for Docker containers, which I only found out last night. So. Uh, which means I <laughs> did all of this today. So that's why it's kind of uh, a little bit rushed and not very clean. Uh, we've already run all of this. Okay. So we're going to pick a model and we're just going to pull down this BERT base uncase. So we're not going to care about capitalization and we're just going to use like kind of a base BERT. Maybe we should have used a still BERT, but I've already downloaded this one. So, oh, I, oh it's too late to change. So we're going to, before we're gonna get this uh, tokenizer and we're gonna pull it from this model because we need the tokenizer to match with the model that we're gonna end up using. Uh, I will have to download the model again. Uh, then we're gonna split our training data into tech uh, training and validation. And we're gonna split the labels up. This is all pretty standard stuff. Okay, I need to I need to rerun this. I think factory reset, restart and clear. Uh, we're going to use our tokenizer, and we're going to tokenize all of the training texts and the validation text, and we're going to store this in this variable called the encodings. We're going to do some stuff to, that's necessary in pretty much all uh, deep learning networks, and that we're going to kind of make all of those uh, initial vectors the same length, as to which we're going to pad to it, we're going to truncate, and then we're going to reduce the length to 128, because these uh, questions are actually not that long. Uh, did I run this? Uh, we need to create a, this custom data set that we can feed into our transformers models. This is just pulled from online. Uh, I didn't even think about this for one second. I just looked up how to create a data set to feed into transformers. So you don't need to understand everything that's in there, although I don't think it's too hard. Uh, so we're going to create our data set objects for our training and for our validation. This is the part that's gonna to have to download, but look at that internet. Well, since we're on the Kaggle site there, they've got a really fast internet. So we're just gonna import this BERT for sequence classification model. We're gonna take from pre-trained, which means we're gonna start with this BERT-based uncased model. This looks like a warning, but it says, you should probably train this model on a downstream test to be able to use it for predictions. All right, great, that is what we're doing. Uh, we've got two labels, so it needs to know that. That's just so that the final kind of output is the is the proper shape. Um, I will take an I will make note that I copied most of this code from this nice blog post. So uh, if anything is written poorly here, you can reach out to this guy, uh, not me. But it was, actually it's it works really well. So thanks to that guy. Uh, so we just have these metrics that we'll calculate as we're training. This is also something that you can find from the trans for Transformers uh, website. Um, you can understand kind of what each of these different parameters do, but this is also easy to pull. They have kind of a guide that has this kind of out of the, out of the bag for you. Then we create, so we have this arguments class and we've got this trainer class that takes in our arguments, takes in our model training and validation data sets and the metrics. And then we can train a model. Oh yeah. I don't know at what point weights and biases came up here, uh, but it needs me to enter in this API key. I just didn't have time to figure this out. So I just created a, <laughs> I created an account of weights and biases and uh, put in my key there and it seems to work fine. Uh, but I never imported anything from weights and biases. So, and when I'm doing it on my own, uh, when I did it in here, which I found out this training would take like six hours or something, it never asked me for uh, for this API key. So I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on with that. So we're going to 
log, we're going to calculate a validation every 50 steps or for every 50 batches. And so we can see after our first 50 batches of um, 16 um, samples, we're already getting an accuracy of 87%. And actually, what's interesting is that it doesn't really go up much from there, which tells me that it has a lot of information that it's able to use kind of just really out of the transformer model itself. Like it's able to learn this task with very few samples, which is very cool. So that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, and then what we're going to do is, if you guys remember these uh, samples that we had gone through before, these hand-picked samples. We're gonna, I, I, uh, I put, took these from like the start of the training data and I took the actual training data from the tail of this. So I, I can guarantee that the training has not seen any of these examples because this is the, these are like the final 2,500. So we'll see how well the model predicts them on these records. And I've got two minutes before eight o'clock. So that's that will be the end of the meetup. So don't worry. OK, so a simple evaluation just to make sure that you know we're getting the same accuracy. Val accuracy by eight nine one. Okay, so it saved the best performing one. So it saved this this one here instead of the final one. That's because we had this set load best model at the end. Okay, so then we're just gonna have a few functions for inference. So one to get the probabilities, and the other to get the uh, the arg max the probabilities. So we'll load those in. We'll say, is this a sincere question? The result is that, yeah, the model is pretty confident that that's a sincere question. Trump is best. Insincere. <laughs> I was trying to come up with what word leads to the most insincere result. And I had a very hard time with sarcasm. Uh, isn't this the most of all time. No, does not get it. Okay, so we'll, we'll run the model on these uh, invalid syntax. Oh, shoot. There's no, no function in prediction. I don't know why it's doing that. So, wow, our model was completely correct on all of these. It said that all of these were insincere. And our model actually said that this one was insincere, which is the only one that I actually think is insincere. So pretty impressive model that we have. This is actually the best result I had. I, I ran this through a couple of times and I was always getting a few of them wrong. But uh, once you know it, when it comes to presenting, it does the best. <laughs> okay, that's the, end of, that's the end of my presentation. I can take a few questions if anybody has any. Yeah, just a question regarding that uh, imbalance of the data set. So if, if the data set is so imbalanced, um, in this case, do you accommodate that for um, within the cross-validation itself? Or uh, do you use other uh, analysis tools like SMOUNT? My intuition behind imbalanced data sets is that Un unless you have reason to believe that the like the test set that you're going to be evaluated on is is different in some way so if, if you think that 
that one is for some reason not going to be imbalanced, then I think you need to handle it. But in, unless you think that, then I don't think that you need to do anything with the imbalance. So in this one, I would probably not do anything if I was trying to compete in the competition. Um, I just wanted to, I was just purely because I was having a hard time coming up with instance your questions I wanted to, or instance your predictions, I just changed it. That's the only reason. But maybe other people have some thoughts on that because I'm sure that there are smart ways to handle it when it happens. A uh, different sort of question. And actually, Vijay asked something along these lines in, in the chat. Um, it, it's about a, a tool like Grammarly or, you know, if you're in Google Docs or even Gmail, you get some pretty good suggestions on how to fix your grammar. Uh, I'm guessing that that is based on some of the techniques we've seen today. But do you know how that works and how it gets put together? I have it's, no it's not idea. obvious how... Okay. It's not obvious how you would even use it to predict this is a, a, a grammatically correct sentence or not. And then if it isn't, how you can suggest. There you go. Uh, I mean, it's got to be, they've, they've got to take advantage of some of these models, I feel. Yeah. I know. The, uh, I haven't used Grammarly. I've used obviously lots of Google stuff and it's gotten every day it gets better. And it's the first grammar checker I've ever used that actually makes useful suggestions. Yeah. I'm sure it's probably proprietary. They wouldn't, uh, you know, release the information. Yeah. And they would probably. leave out some information, but they might, uh, yeah, I don't know. They Narrow AI new. application. Yeah. Hmm. But I know that Google was saying how BERT is like a game changer for search. So yeah, so I've heard. Search. Which is also interesting. It's not actually obvious how you would <laughs> take BERT, apply yeah. it to the task of search and make search better. It'd be interesting to know more about that. Mm -hmm. I guess you could just represent the search input, right? With some sort of embedding using an encoder yeah. network like BERT. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at the results of that and treat those as essentially like a recommendation system. And you can say, well, we're just gonna we're just gonna represent our sentence or represent our input using BERT as opposed to whatever however else they were doing it before. Mm. But I that was purely off the top of my head. I don't know if that's yeah. accurate or not. Hey, I have a question. Uh, first of all, great presentation, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Thank regarding you. transformers, could you give me a, like a high level explanation behind the idea of self attention between input tokens? Yeah, so that is essentially solving the problem that I had brought up that these other two uh, models, the tag LM, Elmo, and ULM fit, we're taking advantage of. And that's that it's better to, or there's a lot of information in trying to represent the a word as, it, as it's related to other words in the sentence. So um, is that kind of what you're getting at? Like, why is it, why is that useful? Or... Yeah, and maybe just sort of what what is this idea? The uh, I sort of understand maybe attention is trying to focus on where to or learning where to do the most learning. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? Well, attention, I guess, is a way of you've got so much information in these networks. Like uh, in this network, there will be an output in each of these LSTMs, right? And this actually contains a lot of information, but it's kind of like corrupted over time as it travels all the way through here and so a lot of these even these lstms will kind of like output a state here and the first versions of attention were okay well rather than just taking this final state of the lstm to use in classification or something why don't i look at every one of these vectors and then somehow choose which one to pay more attention to or not in my task and so I think in like translation that was often used and that like all of these vectors would, would be able to contribute 
directly to any of the words as it, as the message is being translated, right? And so that's kind of like some concept of attention is like you've got all of this information and it's about like trying to allow the model to like pick out important pieces rather than just saying this is the only bit of impression you get. Mm -hmm. When it comes to self-attention, that's really, yeah, it's really just about trying to represent a word. It's, it's allowing other words that are in the sentence to also affect the word's interpretation. So like hungry, some, like something that's hungry, the word hungry and the object that is hungry will probably have keys and queries that will add up to a larger number, right? So that the word hungry gets infected with a lot of the object that it is that would be hungry in its in its meaning. And so it gives like a much richer representation of the word hungry than if you're just using a straightforward word or a vector like one vector for hungry and then and then hoping that the model figures out which words it should be paying attention to and also like how that it's like a, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, so do we incur some extra memory costs by using this type of architecture? Well, the the in order to store all of those weight matrices, yeah, I think that these these are pretty big, but it's also about doing it's like a more efficient way of capturing this information. Like if we look at this and let's say we wanted my or let, let's say this let's say this word was hungry and then this word was like dog and if, if there's some words in here that say that the, the dog is hungry in order for the network to be able to capture that the that the dog is hungry it needs to pass some information into this rnn here and then that that information needs to somehow persist uh, through this multiplication through this multiplication through this multiplication there could be and there could be quite a few of them right and then it, and then it can get to the dog and then all of a sudden it can say okay well i've I've stored this information that the word hungry was there at some point, and now I've got dog, and I know that these two can like go along together. You can imagine it's a lot harder to do that than it is to just have one word that looks at every other word like in the sentence as if it's like right next to it, right? Like there's there's not aside from this weird positional embedding thing, it's a lot more of a direct access to that information. And so I would say that it actually probably requires less memory to get the same sort of information capture. Um, but it just so happens that these models are massive. So it's, I mean. Yeah, I think it is quite a bit less memory because essentially you just need to store three linear layers for each attention head. You just need your query key and, and value matrices. Right. I mean, there's no argument that like the, the this model is probably a lot bigger than the LSTM models, but I think that it's capturing a lot more information. So it's more memory efficient, uh, I think. Good question. Uh, like there's so much to learn, you know, it was quite overwhelming. So yeah. Mm -hmm. You uh, if I have to understand the key takeaway from this is like the the framework that was used was probably PyTorch, and the model that you demoed was uh, I believe uh, the transformer. Is it correct statement? Uh, yep, PyTorch. So actually, uh, I can make a few adjustments to that. So PyTorch was in fact the model that we used, but you can also use the transformers library to load in TensorFlow version versions of these models. So that's one of the nice things about transformers is that you don't even really need to care about whether you're using PyTorch or TensorFlow, it will handle all that for you. And then the model itself is based off of the kind of the theory behind the transformer model, but the transformer, it's not, I don't think it's correct to say that it's a, well, it's not correct to say that the specific model is a transformer model. The specific model was Roberta, and oh, let's see, where was it here? In this language modeling step, we used the specific model was GPT-2, which is a transformer model, and also Roberta Large, which is a transformer model. So, but these, these are the specific models. They're just like different pre-trainings or, or different trainings uh, that use the architecture that the transformer model introduced. 
Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. If there are further questions, um, a tradition that we normally do is actually join together and do a clapping for the presenter. But since Matt is doing the presentation today, he probably <laughs> be leading the clapping. So if everyone. Yeah, can... I'm free. <laughs> no more responsibility. Yeah, no, no responsibility today. Um, so if everyone can unmute their mics and join me in a round of applause in five, four, three, two, one.